Hello, everyone. Welcome to May. Um, I'm so excited to bring to you um, the next video strategy. This is episode five. After a long break, um, you may not have known, but all of our recording gear was stolen from my car, and so it's taken a while to get everything back and replaced. So today we are back at her, and uh, today's episode strategy is connected to the last five more minute video, See You Later Sparkles, which has caused quite the stir, um, and this strategy is called the evidence log. Okay, so evidence log, um, just like before, if you have examples of this strategy that you'd like to share... The hashtag for this strategy is going to be hashtag evidence log. And so, um, yeah, share share what you try. We'd love to share with each other and see what we're doing. Um, if you haven't seen the five more minutes video, definitely go take a look and see what all the commotion is about. We are blowing up special education, my friends. And part of this is, you know, there's so many things that are evolving in the world right now around curriculum and IEPs. And so sort of the goals that we are using to determine programs for some of our learners who need the most support. So if you're watching this video, you are probably very familiar with SMART goals. Um, they have pretty much been beaten into us as special education teachers. Um, let's just go through it one more time. Um, S is for specific, M is for measurable, attainable, realistic, timely. And you know, this this acronym is not just used in special education. You can, I mean, if you just go Google SMART goals on the internet, it comes up all over, all over the place. But you know, even my friend um, who is not an educator, Jill, who lives in Edmonton, you know, she even said to me, she's like, you know, I've read a lot of books about setting goals and that SMART strategy never really worked for me. She's like, I just don't think like that. She's like, I like your strategy way better. And, you know, I think that a lot of people feel that way, but like, oh, I remember in university writing IEPs at the time and not knowing like why I didn't like them, but I just knew I didn't like them. And so I tried to change things. And my poor instructor just didn't know what to do with me because I just wanted to change everything. And uh, of course, so I didn't get a very good mark in my special education class. And so I marched to the dean and I was like, dean. These IEPs are not good. Smart goals need to go. And she probably gave me the best advice I'd ever received. She's like, Shelly, you need to suck it up now. Change the world later. So this video episode is dedicated to Dean Marianne Doherty, who said that to me because it is now May 14th, 2019, and we are changing the world. So why do smart goals need to change? And so these are the four kind of big ideas we presented in the video, which is... You know, SMART goals historically in special education have aligned with that idea that a, um, a misunderstanding and a problematic assumption that, you know, if you can't see learning, then it must not be happening, which we know isn't true. And so, you know, if we're really going to look at IEPs for students today and based on what we know today, uh, we need goals in IEPs, individual education plans to not assume incompetence, but presume competence in all of our kids. Um, we need the evidence that we collect to be authentic and meaningful and actually connected to the places where these kids are included. Um, they need to be aligned to the curriculum of peers. Otherwise, like, why are we even doing this? Um, and also, you know, curriculum is starting to really evolve around um, starting to include 21st century learning skills, or in British Columbia, we call them core competencies. Um, and if you actually look at the competencies, you'll see that a lot of the kids that we're working with with disabilities have a lot of strengths in these areas. So it totally makes sense to start aligning IEPs with some of these ideas. The other thing that we really advocated for in the video was an evolution of SMART goals to have a, have a new acronym. And the acronym that we um, suggested still was SMART, but shifting away from the quantitative towards the qualitative um, goal setting strategy, uh, looking for S as strength-based meaningful, authentic, responsive, and triangulated evidence. So we're going to start this video strategy going through each of these. I've included some references and research that you can definitely look up if you're interested in learning more about those five big ideas. Five, right? One, two, three, four, five. Yes, five big ideas. So let's start with strength-based goals. So I've learned a lot about this because, you know, when I first was in special education, it was very, very much around 
um, that concept of average and proficiency, like where, where should kids be? And if you have been watching the five more minute videos, you found out very early how I feel about the word should. And so this is really looking at what kids can do or what could they do and starting to shift the language away from, um, even like, even like, you know, students will to students can or or even like starting to get students involved in the process especially around core competencies um having them connected to the student themselves like I can or I know um the more that we can get kids involved in this process the better the other thing that I really like about strength-based goals is that I remember um oh my goodness when I was first starting to write IEPs I didn't even realize that what I was doing was so like deficit based but I would look at an assessment like a psych a, a psychoeducational assessment of a student and it would tell me oh this student has a learning disability and they have a weakness area in memory and then I would then write an IEP filled with goals about memory and I just think to myself like oh if I could go back in time to tell myself anything as an early educator it would be this our goal in education is not to fix things that are broken. They're not, you know, we are moving away from this medical model of kids are broken. Kids are not broken. Um, I think, I, I remember I spoke to Faye Brownlee in one of my podcasts and she was talking about the difference between weaknesses and stretches and how, you know, weaknesses remind her of a broken ankle. You can't, you can't repair the strength in your ankle once it's been broken, but you can absolutely build the muscles around it and you can st you can stretch your ankle to make it stronger. And so that's how kind of how I see IEPs now is moving away from weaknesses and thinking about them, thinking about them as stretches. We all have strengths, we all have stretches, but we can use our strengths to build our stretches and build those muscles around those areas that need support because the more we stretch, the stronger we get which is just such a beautiful metaphor to think about um, education plans and how we can help kids. Um, last but not least, and this goes directly against that idea of specific, but I think the more open-ended a goal is, the more we're leaving room for that goal to be met in multiple ways. I can totally appreciate um, a lot of feedback that I got on the video was that um, numbers uh, keep keep schools and educators accountable to individual programs, which I totally appreciate. I mean, IEPs, I really believe in them and feel they have a really big role in accountability for sure. But I think we can still be accountable without being so specific because the more specific it is, the more narrow it is of the evidence that we're collecting and the more, um, more defined that evidence has to be to determine success. And, and one thing that we're really embracing in British Columbia is, is this idea of multiple ways of knowing and multiple ways of being, which is really aligning to Indigenous pedagogy of, you know, there's more than one way to be in this world. And I think this is a really nice connection to what we're learning about in critical disability, about how there's also more than one way to just be in the world in general. And a lot of our kids fall into this category of finding success in the world in their way. And it's different than our way, but I think that's all right am meaningful goals oh wow okay so meaningful goals I actually thought about this one day um, in my own life because I was like what makes my life meaningful what makes the places that I go meaningful and I and I sometimes tell this story when I'm presenting in this idea uh, one day after school I went to the car wash I went to the bank and I went to the grocery store and I realized that I went to those places for very specific purposes or very specific reasons like I wouldn't go to the bank for no reason because I would probably get arrested you know like I mean like there's a really clear connection between like where we are and, and the purposes that we have and so this idea of meaningful goals really connects to these purposes because purposes make the places that we go in our lives meaningful and so you know there are three purposes that uh, all of us have in every place that we go. This is not specific to IEPs or disability at all. And these three purposes, uh, we negotiate all the time and we negotiate all three of them in every place we go. So the first one is the personal purpose. And these are the goals or the purposes that help us to be successful and included in the physical space or the physical community. So this is connected to behavior, but it's no, it's never compliance. This is more about 
um, kind of like knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. I think about, you know, so many times we'll take a kid into the gym and we know that it's okay to throw basketballs, but how do kids know that we can't throw books in a library? Like that's a perfect example of how, how do I need to exist in a place so that I'm successful? But then also, you know, sometimes the gym isn't used for basketball. Sometimes it's used for an assembly. We assume that kids can transfer that purpose. And so personal purpose is, is really important. It's very aligned to positive behavior supports, but just like really, really supporting kids to know what to do in the places that they go. Um, the next one, though, social purpose, because we're not just existing alone in places, we're also existing with other people. And so social purposes, these are goals that help us to be included and successful in the social emotional community. And so this is very much connected to communication, um, interaction, and, and really respecting others' space and how we're interacting with people. Um, and then once once we got that figured out, then we also have to figure out how to learn together. And so intellectual purposes, these are goals that help us to be successful in the learning community. Now, what's really, really important is that we need all three of these things to be successfully included in a place. And uh, we've talked about some of these purposes in some of the earlier five more minute videos. But if, if I think back to like early in my career, a lot of the kids that I worked with who have intellectual disabilities, they were very, very much focused on the top two. And they didn't often have learning goals connected to peers. And what was really interesting is that when I would support classrooms, uh, especially in high school, classrooms would often skip the first two and really focus on intellectual purpose. And so I think it's a really nice example of, you know, we actually need both of those perspectives and lenses to create that inclusive in community for kids with and without disabilities. But here's the thing that is tricky about this framework is that if you've been in special education for, you know, 10 or more years, you will notice right away that, well, this is an IEP. You know, you have behavior goals, you have communication goals, you have learning goals. But the reason why I'm pointing this out to you is because we're going to change our paradigm for how we meet these goals. So special education, I've mentioned this before, evolved out of the medical paradigm, which this is idea of, you know, okay, you have a broken leg. So you go to the doctor to get fixed and then they send you to the bone doctor and then the bone doctor does surgery or puts a cast on or whatever. But it's it's from this perspective that something is wrong. And so if you look at this in education, we, we have done the same thing and still do the same thing all the time. So if there's a personal problem, often linked to behavior, we will pull them out. We'll work on that skill in a different place and then we'll drop them back into the class. We do the exact same thing for the social community. Okay, kids having a hard time communicating or getting along with kids. And so we pull them out. We work with them on skills and then we put them back in the community. And we are going to keep going. If there's a learning problem, we pull them out. We work on that learning problem and then we put them back in. This is very, very problematic though. The first thing is that... This model for kids with intellectual disability hasn't had research to support it since 1974. This is before I was born, okay? So, like, we know inclusion is better. But the other thing, and I've really learned this from Norman Kuntz. If you know Norman Kuntz, he's a disability advocate. He says, the two biggest assu problematic assumptions with this is, first one, if you pull a kid out of a classroom, um, you're assuming that the classroom isn't a support and and part of the support that kids have is actually the peers themselves and it's actually quite ironic if you think about it like we pull all the kids out who can't speak English and then we put them in a class with other kids who can't speak English and then we try and get them to speak English we do the same thing for behavior we do the same thing for reading and you think to yourself in that context the only person who's the model is the teacher themselves and so it makes the workload very very high in diverse settings however the whole community is actually supporting students who need supports um, the other problem is that these these um areas are not standalone like you don't need me to tell you that if a student is having some behavior difficulties that's going to come out in other areas it's going to show in learning it's going to show in social aspects of their life and so to actually target these skills in isolation of each other um there's some kids will just never be in the classroom because they're always working on things that they need support in and um, the third reason why this model is tricky is connected to universal design. If you are pulling a kid out of a community to work on a skill, you're assuming that no one else 
in the community actually needs that support. And we all know for every kid that's on an intervention list, there are 15 kids who aren't on an intervention list. No one is going to be harmed by receiving supports designed designed for one or two kids. So we're going to kind of talk about this model and what an alternative is, but you're going to notice here that, um, you know, Norman Kuntz, who I mentioned before, he, he has such a great example of this. He says, you know, pulling a kid out to work on, um, a skill outside of the setting that they have to apply it is is like pulling a kid out of a swimming pool, teaching them how to swim in the parking lot, and then dropping them in the water. Because if you change the place, you change the purpose. Just like my example with the car wash. If I'm learning how to wash my car in a place that's not the car wash, it's going to be so much harder to transfer those skills in than if I actually just learn how to wash my car at the car wash. And so what this is really connecting to is that these purposes are actually connected to place, which is part of this idea of meaningful goals, is that place matters. Now, if you think about IEPs historically, they're very purposeful, but they're often not connected to place. And so what often happens is kids will have a lot of purposes, but because they're not connected to place, as inclusion starts to continue to roll forward, kids are now in multiple places and the purposes don't align. And so they end up being integrated into classrooms instead of included because the goals that they have aren't meaningful to the places that they're in. Um, but this, this makes sense because if you think about IEPs historically, they haven't been connected to place because when IEPs were, were initially created, they were only designed to be implemented in one place because students were self-contained or in a segregated setting that was still usually one setting. But when you actually look at place, place um, targets the person within it, but also everyone else who's in it. And so it actually addresses the whole community and who the individual student that we're designing um, support for and how they're connecting to the other people in that community. Um, and so we, we know that purpose has a very strong connection to place to for every, every one of us in all of our lives. And so how can we transfer that into meaningful IEPs? Um, but I think if we really think about the actual inclusive vision, like what's the goal for all of our kids is that the more places that individuals feel included and feel belonging in and that are meaningful, the better. And so, you know, sometimes we're starting small in one or two places, but I think the goal is to really increase those places over time. And part of the ways we can do that is starting to really, really be really mindful about the places kids go and are the goals meaningful to those specific places. Okay, so what is the alternative? So this is actually um, part of, we're doing kind of a IEP redesign in British Columbia and, and really kind of looking at some of these big ideas. And one of these big ideas is, is there a way that we can, you know, think of rather than a medical paradigm, but an inclusive paradigm for students, which looks at, um, it actually targets the place first, you know, where are the different places that, that kids are going? And then what are the multiple places with multiple purposes within that place and how do they interact with each other now it's very possible that these bubbles will not be the same size and so then part of the work and sort of part of the planning is you know designing goals that will bring balance to both an individual and balance to a community and the nice thing about this is that these are very very much connected to the next part of our SMART goal acronym which is A which is authentic goals and so I'm going to start with what authentic goals means in British Columbia and then I'll connect that to everyone else who's not in British Columbia but in British Columbia um, we have goals that are kind of connected into four big areas. Um, if you watch the backwards design five more minutes video, we started to talk about these things. But authentic goals really means that goals for IEPs are connected to a common curriculum of peers. So often the goals that are in IEPs are not connected to peers. And so when kids are with peers, the goals that they're working on are not authentic to the community that they're a part of. So in British Columbia, how our curricular model is organized is we have big ideas, we have content goals, um, and then we have curricular competencies, which are really our skills and um, our skills and processes and then we have core competencies the core competencies are the big one those are the ones that are, are connected to the 21st century skills um and uh 
kind of the, the, the new curriculum that's evolving in many places around the world. If you're not in British Columbia, don't worry, because most curricular models have goals of some kind that represent um, these, these four, at least three of these ideas. Um, they just might be called different things. So I know Alberta, our province next to us, they're really looking at curriculum that's conceptual, which really aligns with the idea of, of big ideas or understandings. Um, every curriculum I've ever looked at has goals that are connected to content or knowledge, and then are, they're often balanced, depending on where you are, um, by different ratios, but there's always a combination of knowledge-based goals and then kind of skills or attitude goals. And then the new one that's really starting to make its mark in curriculum reform is, is as we mentioned, 21st century learning skills, or um, as we call them in BC, uh, core competencies. Okay, let's keep going. R responsive goals. Okay. So here's the thing about responsive. Responsive is almost the opposite of standardized. And the reason why this is important is because often people think that if we're moving away from standardization, that we're abandoning curriculum, which is very, very not the case. We're, we're still using goals. They're still standards based, but the goals that we're choosing are responsive to the needs of the class. In terms of an IEP, how we're talking about responsivity here, though, is looking at the student's needs, the, the, the student's values, and the family. And so the, how we're talking about responsivity is what is the curriculum that we're using to respond to the student and the family's goals for where they see themselves. And so this is very student and family driven um, and responding to the strengths and stretches of students with that focus on balance, as we mentioned before, but also really using these, these kind of competencies or 21st century learning skills to how can we use these goals to respond to those student and family values. So depending on where you are, these goals are going to be organized in different ways. And your actual list of competencies might be different because um, just like we're talking about core competencies or these 21st century learning skills being responsive to students, they're also responsive to classrooms and schools and even provinces. So if you look at the difference between the competencies from BC and even Alberta, you're you're going to see that there's even some value shifts between the competencies that have been chosen, even at a provincial level, because this is not standardized. It's responsive to the strengths and values of the place. And so if you look then at Japan, you're going to see another lens. It's very, very spiritually driven. Um, Alberta is very um, economy driven. British Columbia is very social responsibility driven. And it's not that one is good or what is bad, but they're just reflective of place. And I think that it's actually really neat to look at how competencies are shifting to reflect the places and the people um, of, of who's deriving these goals because then you get you start to see how we can actually support each other because I think we need competencies in all of them. So I'm going to show you British Columbia's competencies, but definitely take a look at your curriculum because I'm sure um, as we start to continue with this reform, um, you're going to start to see some of these skills popping up more. If you don't have 21st century learning goals or core competencies, take a look at uh, BC, take a look at Alberta, because there's some really, really nice ones to draw from. Um, the nice thing about British Columbia's core competencies is they're actually connected to the inclusive purposes that we talked about um, in the previous section. And so we have six core competencies altogether, and they can be arranged in different ways. Um, I like to arrange them um, for IEP purposes to the inclusive purposes. So depending on the needs of the student and the values of the family, you have competencies that we can target to build personal to, to build personal. Um, identity, social identity, or intellectual identity, and and goals. And so under personal, we have competencies, and they're called personal awareness, responsibility, and positive personal identity and culture. And I love the culture, identity, and culture one. I haven't found one similar anywhere in the world. And so I really, really love that one because it talks about like who I am and you know what my identity is within places. Um, the social competencies is basically looking at competencies at a micro level and a, and a macro level. So, you know, what are skills that I can build um, my communication, but also my social responsibility and so how my interactions affect um, the world at large. And then the intellectual competencies really target critical and creative thinking. These competencies are cross-curricular. They're connected to some of those 21st century learning skills. And um, I, I know in the video I mentioned what I learned from my friend uh, Laura Tate, who talks about 
build these as, you know, skills or um, competencies of, of, of who we become. We become communicators. We become socially responsible. We become personally aware. Like these are not things that we can necessarily evaluate um, in the same way as other goals. The nice thing is that if you look at this in terms of the actual framework, it can really, really help, especially when showing students and families the purpose of IEPs is really moving away from fixing to providing balance, um, balance to individuals and to a classroom. The nice thing too that I love is that all of these goals are no longer IEP goal bank goals. These are goals that are common to the entire province. All of the kids are working on these goals. And so for the very first time that I've ever seen, we now have a common curricular base for every single student in the province, which I think is just phenomenal. Okay, last but not least, the T, triangulated evidence. Okay, so I'm going to be really honest with you. I had no idea what triangulated evidence was until I started to do my PhD, but it's actually so useful because I was learning about qualitative data. And the more I learned about it, I'm just like, why don't we just use this for all kids? Because um, all kids could benefit from this, and I think that there's really a need for it. Um, I know I was looking up some work by Damian Cooper, who's, who's a big assessment guy, and he was just saying, you know, like, not only is triangulated evidence useful but kids need it because it'll help kids be successful in a way that's actually more valid and reliable than typical quantitative methods so um, what triangulated evidence is is uh, you know you look at a goal and in the case of assessment we're looking at how students are communicating their learning around a goal um, now, historically, the only really piece of evidence that we've collected has been um, really really uh, how can I say it, like, um, viewed through the lens of the written word or written language. And so what triangulated evidence um, helps us to do is look at how can we use, not to, like, we're still including written language as part of evidence, but to also value oral language and visual language, because often if kids have a barrier in one of those areas, they often have a strength in another one. If I think about me, for example, I have a really hard time with written language, which is why I have a lot of podcasts and videos, um, but I, I'm very strong oral language and visual language. And so often if if I can rely on the other two, then it helps with my written output. If you think about, you know, um, historically, though, visual and oral language have only been seen as adaptations to a goal, whereas in, in new curriculum, especially in British Columbia, these are now, these all now have equal weighting. So, you know, if you have one student, for example, who's a strong writer, but is not a strong speaker, and then you have another student who's a strong speaker, but not a strong writer, we have overvalued the writer, which is actually really colonialized of us. And so this is really opening up. And this is not just about kids with disabilities. This is with all kids, is we want to help kids to show their learning in multiple ways, not just multiple times in one way. Now, there's also a lot of work. Um, I know that this has been this triangulated um, evidence. We've come we've come to in the past, but it's very very hard to collect evidence that's not written without the use of technology, which is why technology has a really important role in this. Because how we capture this evidence is, is there's going to be different methods. And so if we kind of zoom in on that a little bit, um, the reason why written language has been kind of the way of assessing is because it's a product. Like we can take it home and we can assess it. You can't take a conversation home. You can't, you can't take um, an observation home unless, of course, we can turn it into a product. And so that's what technology has been really useful for and a really good, great use of iPads and iPhones. And so one of the first things when I work with my EAs is to help them to show like, you know, observations and conversations are things that normally haven't been able to be captured. But now with, you know, having phones in our pockets, these are things that are much more um, easily captured. So just if you look at some different types of evidence here, we've now opened up what it means to collect evidence around a goal. So if you look at um, observations, this can be videos. Um, if you have a student who's doing a performance task around a goal, film it. That can be evidence. Um, anecdotal comments. And so if, you, if you're observing someone and you're taking some notes, that can count as evidence. Now here's the thing, friends. Behavior can still be a goal that we're working on. And if you're really married to SMART goals, like the old SMART goals, there can still be a place for them and in that there can still be a place for quantitative 
evidence and the frequency tallies. But I think what we're really trying to say here is that behavior goals and frequency or observations just simply based on frequency is no longer enough for it to be the only piece of evidence to really show growth in learning. Because if we're only relying on this um, frequency talents and behavior observations, we're missing out on so much more. So if you're really married to behavior goals, keep them in there, but then just add some other ones that aren't necessarily um, relying on that observable behavior. But there is a place for it. So all of you who just can't let it go, there is a place. Um, in terms of conversation, conversations can be with a student. They can be with staff members. You can also try and capture them between two students. Um, you can be conversations with family members. But um, this is basically conversations either to or with someone or between other people. How can we capture that? That can be an anecdotal record. That can be um, a, a, a recording. Any of these can count. Products, we're still capturing products. And so this is going to be where we're going to get a lot of our written our written um, evidence. However, this can't just be written out evidence because a lot of our kids communicate not with words uh, or not with written words. And so this can be student work samples. This can be photo photographs or really any type of artifact that captures learning in a moment. I know um, I had an instructor at Simon Fraser University, a uh, little shout out to Michael Ling. And I remember he brought in as a class one day, all of, he calls them commonplace books. And he carries these journals with him around the world. And whenever he learns something, he just looks for an artifact anywhere that's around him. And he writes down the learning and then he puts that artifact in this commonplace book and does a reflection on it so if you look at these books they just like look, look these look like these incredible portfolios that include ticket stubs and napkins and beautiful drawings and you know it's something that uh, uh, oh my goodness I would love to do it but you realize that this is this is this is a the beginning of portfolio work that can really work for any learner Okay, so the, 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 the next thing I'm going to kind of show you in terms of triangulated evidence, because a lot of questions that I get is, well, how much is enough? And, you know, like, what do we need for triangulation? And so basically, um, the more, like, when you look at your evidence, because you may have a ton of evidence. And so, you know, you think about, if you think about, I know this is a kind of a weird connection, but whenever I t teach kids about portfolio evidence, I tell them, I'm like, imagine you're going into a crime scene everything in that space is possible evidence. And so you collect everything. Everything counts. Once you collect it, then you start to sort it and you choose your best pieces. You choose the pieces that are going to help you win the case. And so this is what we're doing here in terms of how do you know what evidence to choose? It's helping kids and teams and teachers and just everyone who's in this community to say, let's look at all of the evidence for a period of time. That could be a term, that could be um, a unit, that can be even a year and say, okay, what's the goal? What are the best pieces of evidence? And we're going to look for evidence that shows learning in multiple formats. And we're going to look at... Um, you know, different places that these goals are being are being practiced in. Um, uh, some some guiding principles here, because um, again, like the more we can get students to do this, the better, because this is where the learning is. But you want to choose at minimum the three best pieces of evidence in at least two formats, keeping in mind that students and families are really, really, really going to like the product. So student samples are going to be really important. Um, this last bullet, though, I, I don't think that this is necessarily um, a major or break piece but if you really really want to solidify your confidence of assessment looking for pieces um, of evidence that are in multiple places and the reason why I really like this one is because then you can also count a student's home as a place um, and so you can actually open up evidence collection to families to say hey if you capture a student meeting a goal in your home take a picture send it in because that can be part of the evidence collection which will definitely get some buy-in from families and students for sure. Okay, so here is the strategy. It is called the evidence log. And so this is basically a strategy that helps you organize all the evidence that are kind of um, being developed out of these kind of new qualitative SMART goals. And so I've, I've created two examples or two different logs because in British Columbia, we have evidence for two different purposes. So if this, just pick the one that works for you if you're not in BC, but 
Um, we have evidence that's going to be around core competencies and we have evidence that's going to be around actual content. The reason why they're separated is because they actually serve different purposes and we are actually not evaluating core competencies. We're helping students to evaluate them themselves because all students have core competencies. And so the first one I'm going to show you is the core competency evidence log. And so you can see up at the top here, um, evidence log four. This is where you put the student's name, school year, the term. And then there's a place to put um, the actual reflection on a goal. What you put in this log is only the goals that you've targeted for that period of time. So what we're really looking to do in BC is that the IEP is written in the first term and then the following terms we actually have evidence uh, around the goals that we target. So you may not have all of the IEP goals on an evidence log but by the end of the year you would because you just want this to kind of be a short snapshot, snapshot just like all report cards are of goals that we really really targeted. The other thing you're going to notice here is that under the progress this is written as an I can statement because we want kids to be a part of the self evaluate well we want them to actually do the self evaluation themselves so we have here three options um, I need a new goal which is totally okay it's totally okay um, I want to keep working on the school or I have met the school and I'm ready for the next challenge and so I'll talk I'll talk to you a little bit about how you know and how you can help students to know which ones to pick and then we have three columns here um, around the different types of evidence that you have to support the actual goal. Now, when we're sending these evidence logs home with a report card, we're not actually attaching the evidence. We're just attaching the location of where that evidence could be or, or, or is um, with the development of a lot of digital portfolios this could be a link I know when I did this with my students this was uh, before the days of digital portfolios and so sometimes this just meant you know the red binder in room 149 um as I started to become a little bit more technologically savvy, um, they would be USB sticks. And so I would put in the location USB stick in room 149. And then by the end of the year, you could set, like I would copy that USB stick and send it home with kids and they'd have a really nice collection of their work. Um, in order to do this though, I taught all of my students and the support staff and the teachers, I said, nothing goes home before anything goes home. Take a picture, make sure that I see it. Because what was really nice is if a student finished something that they had done in class, I would actually interview them about it and be like, okay, tell me about this. What did you learn? Because that is prime evidence. And then they can take it home. And then we've collected the evidence for the log. Okay, the curricular and the content log, how this is different is that the core competencies the students are evaluating, but for curricular and content goals, um, we can evaluate those. And so in BC, we've got, we divide these into two types of goals. One is supplemental and one is replacement. And that is really dependent on the on targeted type of learner that we're addressing. So, you know, who it's designed for, supplemental uh, curricular goals are for students who have learning disabilities um, and replacement um, replacement goals are for students who um, have intellectual disabilities. Although, of course, like anything, um, you know, it's not always it's not always going to be that black and white. And so we have we have two options um, that teams can decide which is going to work best for the student. But really, the only difference here is under progress. The three options are really now about the students instead of from the student's point of view. So. Um, student is developing their skills connected to the school. So this is really the emerging phase, which you'll see at the top here. Um, and then we have student, um, student is still working on the school and student has met the goal and is ready for the next challenge. So it mirrors the language of the previous. Now, at the top under progress, I've put kind of both options because depending on where you are, you might use different things. So I know in British Columbia, we're really moving away from grades. And so we're using some of these kind of descriptors. So it might be, I've seen some that are emerging, developing proficient, or it could be um, approaching minimally meeting fully meeting so depending on who you know who or what your what your context is that might change you'll also notice that um, on the bottom there's on the bottom of the comment box there's also an option for grade um, I know uh, for a lot of students in high school this is really important if other students are being graded because then they can actually have a grade on their report card that's directly connected to their IEP goal um because let me tell you, all kids know if a grade is fake. So this can actually be a meaningful and authentic goal. 
Okay, it's time for some examples. So I'm going to kind of take you through examples for both of these different types of goals. But, you know, go back to our SMART goals, like our new SMART goal acronym. And, and as I walk through these examples, see if you can kind of pick out, you know, what makes these examples strength-based, meaningful, authentic, la la la, and triangulated. So here we go. We're going to start with core competency. So my first example is a little guy. Uh, we will call him VG. He's in grade two. He has autism. So the inclusive lens that his family has chosen is the social lens. And the core competencies that we've targeted is social responsibility. And so here's his IEP goal. So all of you who emailed me who wanted an example of IEP goal, here you go. So the actual goal is the same as the peers, which is what makes it very, very um, community oriented and inclusive. So this is the goal for everyone. I can be part of a group by. Now, the objective is where we get specific to individuals. So these are not the same as everyone. So for, for VG, his goal is I can be part of a group by choosing a buddy and taking turns. And so that there, that's his IEP goal. You'll see it's very, very not specific, but that's okay because let's take a look at the evidence log. So this is the end of his term one. And so let's take a look here. So October eight, uh, 2018, the goal, I can be part of a group by choosing a buddy. So what do we have here? We have two pieces of observation evidence and one piece of conversation evidence. So um, if you go back on the other slide, um, I, I can't share the video, but I can tell you about the video. So this is VG and VG chooses two of his buddies to read with him and they tell him um, it's his term and then he mimics them. And he, he was doing this as part of his... Um, uh, readers workshop the first 20 minutes every day and so uh, it was it was incredible to see and so there's also a classroom teacher comment so VG reads with his buddies every day over the past few months I think he has read with almost every student we are also noticing he's becoming more verbal during other times of the day and so this is a perfect example of a classroom teacher um, providing a comment about an observation uh, there also is a conversation with a peer I love when V chooses me to read so that would that's a conversation that was captured that also counts as evidence my friends and so here we have two pieces of evidence one piece of conversation evidence and so that's your three and so um, this was the team was confident saying that he has met the goal of choosing a buddy and so on the next um on the next evidence log for the next term, that goal would would be would not be there. It would stay on the first term, and we would put a new goal in. The second goal, though, taking turns. This one was one that that um, the family and the team decided that that we would still work on because we didn't have three pieces of evidence, and so we had the observation of him doing it in reading, and the conversation with the classroom teacher. VG is great at choosing his buddies for reading. We are going to try and get him to choose his buddies for phys ed, and so this was a conversation um, that is evidence and so it also is the next step so this would be a goal that we would still be working on this one would stay in the evidence log and then we could choose to add another one okay think about it how does this align with our new smart goal acronym oh okay keeping going here we go ts so this is a grade three four class uh the student has autism so this is she um chose um, to look at our IEP through an intellectual lens and the core competencies that was targeted was creative thinking. So here's the common goal of peers. I can deliberately learn a lot about something by, and you'll notice the, the red letters here is, you know, what makes it very um, kind of a meaningful is that you start with I can and just turn it into a goal, a follow up by adding the word by at the end. And then your objective just is basically completing the statement. So what what TS's objective is, is so I could deliberately learn a lot of something by researching something I'm interested in over time. So this was a project that the whole class was doing. Um, they all chose uh, an interest, uh, basically a subject that they were going to kind of research over time. And they had this field book. And so as they learned more things about whatever they chose, they could kind of collect their learnings. And so they would kind of check in every few weeks. And so TS chose to learn about hummingbirds. And so the field book itself is an example of a product um, here's a photo of Tia uh, working with her book. And then this here is a video. Um, I asked TS about what she had learned and she was going through the whole book about migration and she had made her own hummingbird feeder. So it was a really great example um, of, of, you know, how you could, you know, use the product that's being built in class, but then just having a conversation about it with the student. So this would be TS's evidence log. 
They have been working on this throughout the year. So this will be a term three evaluation. Um, and so we have the goal. I can deliberately learn a lot about something by. So we had tons of evidence of this. We had a product. We had observations from both the classroom teacher and from TS and TS's mom who wrote a little comment, which was great. And then the conversation with um with TS herself. So let's just see what some of these comments are. I love the one from her mom. Okay. So note from mom, T watches her hummingbird feeder that she made every day after school for 15 minutes and takes notes and draws. She loves it and says she feels like a scientist. So this is actually a combination of a conversation and an observation, which is great. And you'll notice that like very often a really good piece of evidence will hit multiple, um, hit multiple formats, which is great. You'll also sometimes notice that they hit multiple goals, also great. Um, and then a note from T herself, I love hummingbirds. I think I want to learn about bees next. And so through that evaluation, T decided that she has met this goal and she is ready for a next challenge, which we all agreed with. Okay, next example. So here is ML. And ML is in grade two, three. She has autism and an intellectual disability. Um, her inclusive lens was social and the core competency that they're targeting is communication. So this is actually a video of ML. This class was, it was really interesting. They were teaching everyone in the class about flexible learning spaces. And so kids could kids had kind of like their home base. And then when it was flexible learning time, they could choose different places in the classroom to work. And so sometimes they, there it was a low table and a carpet and a high table. Um, there was some standing desks. So it was a really great way to really um, teach it. But then part of the teaching was helping kids to reflect, to know, you know, why did they choose certain spaces and does that space work for them? So we actually made um, ML's goal specific to, to that um, classroom goal that was being worked on by everyone. So common goal of peers, I can ask and respond to simple um, direct questions by and then ML specific objective using my AAC device to answer questions about where I like to sit in my classroom. So she is just learning how to use this AAC device. You can see her visual support in front of her. But um, what you will notice in this video is that she has a really hard time with this task. And so when we actually looked at the evidence that we had for her and we talked to the SLP, the speech and language pathologist, we all agreed that this actually wasn't a great goal for her, which sometimes happens. And so it's okay to abandon goals. We just explained why that was. And so we can see here, um, conversation with SLP, ML is using AAC to answer yes or no questions. I think we should shift this goal to naming different classroom locations to work. So we just shifted this now. Um, we've decided that we need a new goal and then we put in the new goal. So we kept the I ask and ask respond simple questions, but then we actually changed it to using my AAC device to name and locate classroom work locations. So, you know, really moving it away from, you know, like a little bit more specific so we could model that AAC device so that it would become more fluent for her. But this is totally something that's possible. You are not, uh, we are not locked in and married to goals. Um, if you abandon them, just make a new one that's more appropriate. It is okay to do that. Okay, so that was a few examples of core competency goals. I'm going to show you a couple more um, with curricular goals. Uh, both of these examples are high school students. I find that uh, curricular goals are... are um, extra important in high school because even though elementary has multiple contexts, they're often in a similar space together. But in high school, the more inclusive we get with students, the more different places that they're in. And this is where all of this work started from was I was in a high school trying to make IEPs for kids and, you know, they were in home ec class, but we had no home ec goals and they were in science class and they had no science goals. And so you're going to notice as kids get older and are more included in kind of those um, settings where they're going to multiple places for learning that these goals are going to come in really really handy so the first one I have for you is a grade 8 example so this is JK um, she has Down syndrome she's in grade 8 and she's in a math 8 class which I just it's my favorite thing ever so the common goal of peers so this is the same for everyone I know surface area of volume of regular solids including triangular right prisons and cylinders by now that's the grade eight goal. Now we're going to zoom in specifically for JK. What is JK going to do aligned with that common goal of peers? So um, JK's goal is identifying the two-dimensional shapes 
um, shape faces of a prism. And so the shape faces that we targeted were circle, triangle, rectangle, square, which you'll notice are very, very functional and very, very common to goals we do in a life skills class. But these are much more authentic and place based. Um, the second objective she had is to actually build a rectangular prism. And you can see just from the photos here, this is her rectangular prism. She made it. It's so beautiful. Um, and then there's a video of her building that. And then the bottom one is a, just a screenshot of another video of her identifying and matching up the, the, the four shape faces. And the next step was this was actually labeling a, labeling a prism with these shapes, which was, which was very cool to see. So this was her evidence log. And so this is um, the beginning of term four. So this is what we would call in BC as a replacement goal because because JK is meeting not meeting the grade eight goal she's re, she's meeting a replacement goal to the grade eight goal so this would then become her grade on her report card for that class so um, I know surface area and volume by identifying two dimensional shape faces and so we have a product a conversation and an observation um, the conversation with EA JK knows all her shapes it takes her a bit of time but she gets them right every time. Um, which I thought was really cute. And then the actual building, the prism, this one, the comments from the classroom teacher, uh, Jay works in her group and she is the builder. She builds the rectangular prisms for her group. And then, um, the group then solves the surface area for it. So that was a really nice example of actually the students adjusting the purpose for her, which was really nice. And so she had enough evidence to, uh, meet that goal. And so she ended up getting an A in math eight. So this was attached to her report card in her report card would have communicated that this was based on a replacement goal so it was really clear to the family um, that she would so she's this is this grade is being based on her individualized goal but you know what she deserves an A she met her goal good for her Okay, my last example, this is a grade 12 student who is in a marketing 12 class. Um, I love this one so much. So he has an intellectual disability. He has autism and Down syndrome, so he's negotiating a lot. Um, this is, if you remember um, my TED Talk, this is the student um, who was under the table. So this is my guy. And so um, not only did he come out from under the table, but he also started to go to classes. This is a really nice example um, of, of him and and what success he ended up having. So the common goal for peers in Marketing 12, I can categorize products and identify target market populations by, and then the specific strategy for D was choosing products designed for children, parent, and teenagers. So we actually did a survey and asked different people in the school, and they chose with pictures, and it was really, really quite neat. And then he, then he went to Future Shop and took pictures of what everyone, what everyone voted for, and then he created, you can see at the top here, this book. Um... And in the book, it has, you know, what would kids buy? What would a parent buy? And then he had to go kind of create a, a, a little picture collage that he had created. And then he shared that book with his class, which was which was very cool. Um, his second goal, I can design and identify the four Ps. Now, I'm going to be honest, I didn't know what these four Ps were. And so he taught me a thing or two. Uh, the four Ps of marketing, everyone, are price, product, placement, and package. So he actually got to choose a favorite product um, and identified the four Ps. So if you look at the right here, this is him. He chose it all right. He didn't just choose a can of Coke. He chose a case of Coca-Cola. So that's him. He made it very clear which product he wanted. And then he had to take pictures of, you know, what was the price of the product, uh, where on the shelf was it placed, and uh, what was the package. And so just, uh, just a really nice. And so then that was part of his work for that class. So here is his evidence log. Okay, so here we go. Um, so we have two pieces of evidence for products. So we had both the, the, the two books that he had created, the observation um, and a conversation. So you can see here the EA. Um, D loves this class. He surveyed the teacher and all the students in this class to find out what they would buy at Future Shop. Uh, we then went to Future Shop after he collected the information and took photos of items for his research book, and then he presented that book to his class. Um, the second one was a comment from the classroom teacher. Um, that was an observation. When D showed his video reading his book about his four piece project, I could hear a pin drop in the class. I think it set the bar very high for the other students' project because D did such a great job on his. So, you know, of course, he got an A in that, but again, it connected to his goals, so he was pretty proud of that. Whew! Okay, friends, that's it. That's the evidence log. So um, I hope that that is helpful. Um, I, I'm, 
I, I a lot of the conversations that um, came out from the the video was a worry. Like I think I mentioned this before, but the worry about accountability. But if you can look at these evidence logs, you can see like we're still very very much um, attending to the progress of students for sure. Um, I actually think it's more accountable because these evidence logs are actually sent home every term, as opposed to um, reviewing IEPs once a year. But because they were so authentic and connected to the classes that kids were in, um, we were really moving away from just kind of panicking and trying to find evidence. Um, I was in a session today and one um, support teacher said something. So it was so good. She goes, I feel like this strategy can really help us to be evidence collectors, not evidence creators. And I think that that should just be a t-shirt because I think um, if you're a support teacher out there in the world, you know that when it's IEP review time, we are running around like mad trying to collect enough evidence um, to, to show progress on these goals. But if it's just a part of what we're already doing, then, you know, it's it's really going to share that workload and really um, help students to get more involved in it. So last but not least, here is the, the new SMART acronym. Um, one more time, I will post both examples, um, or sorry, both uh, templates, the competency and the content one on the website. Uh, here's the website, five more minutes, and you'll see under inclusion strategies, you will have the video and you will have the templates. Um, one last time here is the hashtag. So if you make some of these and you want to share them, get feedback from people, stick it on Instagram. Um, just make sure you honor, um, anonymity and make sure you change names and, um, make sure you put happy faces on kids faces because we really want to honor privacy, but, um, let's share with each other and see how we're doing. Whew. Okay. I'm looking forward to your feedback. Thanks everybody.